Mm. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight is part five and the conclusion of our series, uh, uh, Washer, uh, MacArthur, Washer, Piper versus uh, John, Peter, and Paul. And uh, tonight the uh, subject will be, uh, Can We Lose Our Salvation? So uh, we have uh, received verses from people uh, for many years. People send us verses and say, well, explain this first then. If, if you believe you cannot lose your salvation, explain this one to me. So we've collected the verses that people have been sending us, and we're going to go through them one by one. Uh, but first, uh, let's introduce the panelists here. Uh, and uh, let's start with Austin. Say hi to everybody. Hey, guys. How's everybody doing? Uh, my name's Austin. My channel's name's Austin Bell. I do uh, Christ Ministries and Online Evangelical Christian Ministry. And I just wanted to put out for today's uh, <clears throat> hangout, if anybody was wondering where uh, Brother Bill or Brother Jose and Brother David Fleming went, they went on a website called Vimeo. It's V-I-M-E-O. And they have profiles over there. And if you're interested, I can send you their, uh, their name and their username from that website. Yeah. Now you mean uh, Brother Jose, his channel is uh, Born, uh, Again Born Again, Se Born Again Born 771, I think. Yeah, Born Again 771, and Bill, he's from London, and his is, is uh, Christian, Christian Lord. Lord. Right. Okay. All right, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Okay, we got Brother Eric next. Hi, uh, my uh, YouTube channel is Jesus Knight 72 um, if you have any questions, anything you want to pose to me, feel free to drop me a line whenever you want. And uh, hopefully, um, based on some recommendations to me, I, I might sometime soon be producing some of my own videos on that channel. I'd like to base them off of uh, questions that people may have for me. So uh, feel free to drop me a line. I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right. Very good. I'm sure you'll do very well with that new, new um, project. And uh, thanks for joining us. And now we have Brother Jackson. Hey, um, my name is Jackson. My YouTube channel is Mecca Wing Zero, the the word zero, not the number zero. And I am a I'm a Christian Aspie. I have Asperger's syndrome, and one of the main reasons that I have my icon displayed rather than my camera on is because I stim up a storm when we're on the air. Okay. Uh, when you say stim, that's a that's a, sh a short for stimulate. When you're when you get stimulated, you start rocking or something, right? Correct. Okay. Sometimes All right. Very intensely. Yes. All right, brother. That's that's perfectly fine. And and uh, uh, you know, if anytime you feel like showing your video of us, that we will that would be welcome too. But thanks for joining us. Where is that clapping coming from? Is that a new feature on no, Google? That's, our, that's the uh, the world is watching, uh, Jackson. I mean, aren't you aware that the, we got a large worldwide audience? Yes, but I still have to th have to think that that the applause, because it's exactly the same each time, has to be an audio file. <laughs> this, uh, Jackson, this shows you are a very intelligent young man. Jackson, I showed. Luke how to use the Google effects and he okay. has been torturing us ever since. <laughs> I don't know. I like repetitive sounds. I might be torturing the neurotypicals, but not myself. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, and just remember when I if I ask a question tonight. <laughs> don't give me that silence. I need someone to start answering these questions. Okay, Tanya. Hey everybody, my name is Galaxy Dreams 3 on YouTube, and I have a vlog where I just talk about, uh, you know, my Christian walk and things, things that I learn, things that I wonder about, things I'm studying and stuff like that, and it's gl I'm glad to be here and looking forward to tonight. Okay, thank you, Tonya. <laughs> All right, um... You remember when we started this, uh, we, we've had about eight hours so far. Uh, this is the, the fifth of this, uh, these episodes uh, on this series. And in the very first one, I laid a foundation showing that there are a whole bunch of uh, clear verses that do not require any kind of interpretation at all, that they just simply say what they say, and nobody debates its meaning. And these verses say that 
we're saved because of our faith in Jesus and there's no other reason no, nothing else is required besides that uh, we went over probably a dozen of those verses and there's many more and tonight before we start I'm going to just read a few of the verses that that I believe clearly state that we are not going to lose our salvation and I want to lay that as a foundation before we start talking about the verses that are confusing everyone okay so first uh, let me see um, in Numbers 23:19, it says, "God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill?" And then in Romans 10:13, oh, by the way, that of course is going to be answered later because if God does not break his promise or change his mind, then uh, we have to say, well, these promises that we're going to, that he's making about our salvation, we can trust him. He's not going to break his promise. Uh, Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall is a, a future statement, but basically it's a promise saying, you shall, so it's one of these promises from God. Ephesians 4, 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed, unto the day of redemption. So sealed unto the day of redemption uh, means that uh, you are, uh, you can't get out. You're, you're sealed in the Holy Spirit. You couldn't get out even if you tried. And then uh, John 10, 28, 29, it says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Uh, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Uh, so here we have Jesus saying that he's holding you in his hand, and, and God the Father is holding us in his hand, and they're never going to let go of us no matter what. No one can get, get out of his hand. And Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, I think uh, Paul's pretty comprehensive there. He's covered everything. There's no, nothing in the world that is possible that could take away our salvation. Uh, John 5.24, I tell you the truth, whosoever hears my word and believes him uh, who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned and has crossed over from death unto life. So this is a declaration that we've already gone into eternal life. We have it. It's already done. And then Romans 6, 23, 24, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when I read the first book, uh, verse, it said God does not take back his gifts. And this says that the gift of God is eternal life. And the first verse I covered says he does not take back his gift. And another gift is uh, in Romans 11:29, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. So the gift of, the, of eternal life, the gift of the Holy Spirit we receive, this is irrevocable. Uh, so these are some of the verses that I think are clearly to, uh, we can rest in and be confident. And I'm going to paste them in real quick so everybody can see them. And then... Uh, you guys, we can talk about these for a minute before we move on to the uh, controversial verses. Control C. Oh, I have to go to my, uh, okay, here it is. Control V, enter. Okay, they're posted there. So um, I, anybody who wants to talk about any of those verses and elaborate further, because obviously I didn't explain them in great detail, I, I think they're pretty darn clear and don't require much of an explanation. Uh, but whoever wants to uh, uh, say anything about that, go ahead and speak up. Uh, I was just going to say that on basic, uh, I know that there's a lot of verses in scriptures that we like to relate to for once saved, always saved, or something else. But just in general reality, even a basic salvation scripture could be a once saved, always saved. Like uh, John 3.16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed upon him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then Jesus Christ, John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth upon me hath everlasting life. We, we see these two words, everlasting, eternal, 
another places in the scriptures that most people don't consider meaning a once saved, always saved verse. But if we have to take it into perspective, uh, you know, what he's saying here is this is God who's sinless, so everything he says is truth. And then we plug those words in that mean forever, uh, basically eternity. So then basically from what we, we get out of this is even a simple verse like that, most people will, you know, they won't understand that's a once saved, always saved verse. But in in reality, this is also a once saved, always saved verse. You know, if it has everlasting, eternal, it, it means forever. So, I mean, uh, these verses that Luke posted are excellent. I just, most times we, we always have to go find a once saved, always saved verse. Sometimes it could be basically a simple salvation verse that would mean once saved, always saved as well. Uh, yeah, let me just say before anybody else comments on that, uh, even the simple verse like, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Uh, that oh, when, it says, when it says they shall be saved, this is a, a promise from God saying, hey, you shall be saved. In other words, if God is stating it, then we have to believe it and trust it and know that he's not going to change his mind or break his promise. So that's a very good point. And when I did this series on uh, biblical Christianity, and the, I think it was the second episode, we went through eternal security, and it was much more thorough uh, than I just did now with these few verses. We had, uh, as you said, um, Austin, uh, a whole bunch of verses that simply are standard salvation verses. When you see the word eternal life, or life everlasting, or shall be, or is saved, these things are, are uh, statements that, uh, you know, it's done. Saved is past tense. Uh, uh, shall be as a promise. Uh, eternal means it's not temporary, it's eternal. So it's a very good point that you just made, and uh, we could go on and on citing verses, but tonight the object is to go over the verses that are confusing people. But uh, okay, so who wants to talk any more about uh, either Austin's point or the, these verses that I brought up so far? Uh, just to add to Austin's point a little bit, I agree with everything Austin just said, and to extend it, I, what I've found about people who think that you can lose or forfeit or whatever salvation is they have to put these things I called if statements in there. Now, if, if you're familiar at all with computer programming, you realize that an if statement is something where a condition is in there, and if the condition is true, the thing gets executed and everything. But the point, the point I want to make is all the if statements that I've heard people add are just completely added, just that. You know, a, a line of code will execute in the program if there's nothing around it, but people like to try to put these if statements like, we'll never perish if he's faithful to the end, or we'll never perish if he keeps it, or something like that, or we'll never... Um, will never come into condemnation if they walk a certain way or if they keep, even if you sometimes they'll do a little more mildly like if they keep believing it even or something like that like or like I saw one really good video from GES Grace Evangelical Society where they'll you'll, you'll the lady was saying she goes over what everlasting means and everything sometimes and some people they still want to hold on to this idea that they can get rid of their salvation, they say something like, well, it's still everlasting, you just don't have it. And that's just another absurd if statement added. So I just wanted to expand on Austin's point that way. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we got two, two great young minds in uh, Jackson and Austin. Very, very, very happy with how, how much you guys know. Uh, who who wants to speak next on this? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to I'd like to kind of build on what both Austin and Jackson said. Both their statements absolutely are true. I think the the key thing here is what Austin, uh, one of the things Jackson was alluding to with the if statement. What this comes down to is anytime you begin to take the verses you mentioned, which are exactly what you said. They're point blank. They're easy to understand. There's nothing confusing about those verses. It's what they call in the political arena is spin. What we do is we take them and then we spin it to mean something else. What it winds up being, and this is a little bit what Austin was talking about, was it becomes a trust issue. See, the enemy wants to get you to distrust what God is telling you. He wants you to not have confidence in trust. And when you begin to believe you can be unsaved, it takes the trust factor away, and then the victory is there. You can't ever grow if you live through your Christian, Christian life distrusting what God's done for you. It's, it's going to be a, t a stumbling block for you entirely through your Christian life. Yeah. Um, you, 
you made me think of the uh, maybe let's see if anybody can identify the very first time that this trust issue came in into uh, became a problem uh, between man and God and what caused this lack of trust the snake <laughs> yes yes the very beginning the very beginning yes that's what started yeah. all that yeah the in in the garden the, the serpent asked uh, Eve says Yea, hath the Lord said? You know, he's trying to question what, whether he really said that or if she understood what he mean, meant. Don't eat from that tree or you'll die. So he was trying to put doubt, and he's still doing it today. You yeah. know, he's still trying to put doubts in our minds. And you know, I don't, I, I don't want to go off onto another topic, but I, I wonder this: if he wouldn't have planted that seed of doubt, if doubt would have ever even happened. I wonder. Mm -hmm. You know, if they ever would have just. Not even doubt, like in a bad way, but just curiosity, kind of doubt, even. You know. Anybody want to try to answer her question? I got an idea. I kind of think that we still have messed things up. Probably. <laughs> mm -hmm. I actually have another question that would go along with that. Uh, I'm not, but this would be it. We'll go right back to it. But uh, was Lucifer? Did he eat of the tree of good and evil? <laughs> Hmm. Interesting. Because this evil had to come from somewhere, and it, we also know in Isaiah that God said He does create evil, but I don't think God would have necessarily injected Lucifer with right, it. Right, but what it, what it what it mentions though, it does mention that Lucifer's problem from the beginning was pride. He what what happened to him was it doesn't mention anything about a knowledge of good and evil so much as it was pride, um, and that's what causes him to say, "I will exalt myself above above the Most High." You know, it, this wasn't about. Um, knowing good or evil, he, 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 as being one of the angels, I believe, was fully aware of that knowledge. Just like uh, I was talking to Tanya about this the other day, and it's funny that she brought this up and uh, that Luke brought this up actually in the garden because it's something that I kind of bring to the attention of people. People automatically assume that when God – God does not do anything for no reason. He, he, everything he does is for a purpose. And it may not seem like there's a purpose, or maybe confusing with the purpose, but there's a purpose. Putting the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden, there was a purpose. And I believe that it was God's intention eventually to share that knowledge with us at some time when we may have been ready for it. Mm -hmm. It was about when we were ready on his terms, not our terms. And it, we, otherwise, he wouldn't have just put it there simply as a possible temptation. There was another reason, and I believe that was probably the reason. Now Lucifer goes, and he he takes one step further. He doesn't, and people kind of stop there and say, "Did God really say this?" But he goes one step further. He calls God a liar. He calls him a liar. He says, "You will not die." Well, God yeah. just told him they would die. He yeah. turns around and says, "You will not." He calls God a liar, and by them eating that, they accepted what he said. Yeah, and, and since since we we're talking about the Genesis t uh, scenario the tonight, and we're talking about eternal security, I just wanted to quickly state this just to destroy it so we can actually go on to verses, because this is just such a dumb concept. But what I often hear some like extreme anti-eternal security people say, or post, or whatever, they'll act like Satan was teaching eternal security in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> By saying, "Well, you'll never perish, but if you do this one thing or something, and that that and that that's what eternal security is, Satan's teaching." And frankly, it's actually exactly the opposite of that, as we've already, I think, demonstrated with our previous commentary. But just so we can get on to actually pre produ uh, being productive and accomplishing things, I thought I would mention that and destroy it. Okay. All right. I think I think those were some very good. Uh, points uh, pertaining to comment, uh, Tanya's question, uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, I guess, make a, a point about the same subject, but it might be leading us into a different direction. I don't want to go off too far, but uh, um, the question was asked, if they had not uh, uh, disbelieved God, would they have fallen anyway? I, I forgot exactly how you phrased it. Do you remember? Yeah, if they would have... Um, if they would have doubted God at any point. Okay, so in other words, if they didn't doubt God and, and be tempted and believe the devil instead of believing God, if they hadn't done it then, would they have? It would have happened later. Well, if if Satan wouldn't wouldn't have brought it up at all, would we 
by our human nature have doubted him at some point or questioned. Well, I think, okay, I, I think it's an interesting question, but it's almost like uh, dealing with. Uh, uh, have you ever watched a movie or read a book that's talking about time travel and past and yeah. future and everything? You know how mind-boggling the whole concept could be of of these time warps and everything. It's just really very. It's like twists my mind into a, like a paradox in a, mm -hmm. in a wrapped in a riddle. <laughs> so, uh, but the idea of of predestination and foreknowledge has to enter into this because um, uh, what we're doing right now, I mean, God knew it before He created us, and and does that mean that we had no choice in anything? Uh, no. It just means that he had foreknowledge of the choices everybody was going to make. He saw all the dominoes lined up and how they were going to all fall, how it would all play out. He knew in advance. So it was predestined in the fact that he knew what was going to happen. And if anybody was going to change their mind, he saw that coming. You know. So um, the other question point that relates to this is the idea of uh, love. Um, why did this have to happen. Do you think it really had to happen with Adam and Eve? And, and uh, uh, if so, what possible reason for the fall and for this, uh, this scene in the, in the garden? Was that necessary for some reason? Okay, I thought that might be a hard question. So it's let me good, tell you, it's a good question. It's it's well, a good question, and it's ultimately I would have to say yes. Okay, well, yeah. I, were you going to answer it, Jackson, or are you saying it's just a good well, question? It's not. It's not a real long answer, but okay. you know, I would just say you know, God knew that evil would come into the world. Obviously, the thing is, we don't know exactly the mind of God. You know, I believe there's even a verse somewhere that says, who can know it about the mind of God. So mm -hmm. the the thing is that to act like, I think sometimes we, it's almost like we picture God as just a sinless human being. And it's the sinless part of that is right. The human being part, not so much in my opinion. I mean, he sees way, 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 way beyond what we do. The way my grandfather explained it to me when I was maybe five or six years old, when he was teaching me some basic math facts, as he said, we were doing a little devotional, and he had these little, he said, can you imagine if there was an ant crawling on this table right now, trying to understand what we're talking about right now? And I've always had that image when thinking of questions like this with us and God. Okay. Uh, I think that the, well, the ant is an interesting idea. I'll give some applause for that. Uh, someone did a real great video about ant, the ant world or something I got somewhere. Uh, but the there's two things that I've wondered a lot about um, uh, that why God would do this. Why did uh, they have to ha have this uh, situation in the garden and these two trees and, and this uh, and then and then also why did why does God release Satan from the bottomless pit? after a thousand years, if he's already got him all tied up and everything else, why would he do that and then have this war in the millennium? Uh, so anybody, I think it's the same reason for both. So uh, I'm trying to give you a little clue as to, not that I have the right answer, but I have an, I do have an answer, and I'll see, see if you agree with this, but uh, I think that these two problems, these two situations uh, happen for the same reason. So anybody have uh, any idea about that? Well, one of the things I was going to say in regards to the um, – I'll let the crickets chirp first. And, um, oh, I thought I got They you wanted to speak first. Um, one of the things I was going to say was ultimately through the fall, God's glory is revealed and his love for us and what he's willing to do to compensate for that. And everything that God does and allows to happen is ultimately for his glory. Yeah, and I have um, a thought. Because um, that's the question, like I said, I've pondered and stuff. I like to think about the deep stuff, you know. Um, here's one thing that I thought of, that the traits of God, such as grace, mercy, and forgiveness, things like that, wouldn't we wouldn't have been able to see those had we not needed it. Therefore, had we not fallen and needed grace, needed mercy, needed forgiveness, how else would we have seen those traits of God? 
You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's just something that I had thought of that that might. And another thing I thought of, I wonder about is, and I don't want to start another whole other thing, but the reason I, I I came up with that was because I wondered if when we're in heaven and everything that's bad is gone, right? There's no more sin. There's no more anything bad. Um, would we see those traits of God? Grace, mercy, forgiveness? No, not really because there'd be no need for them. So it's a good thing that we did fall or else we wouldn't have seen those traits. So that's kind of how I came up with that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to give you... I'll give you a pl applause, uh, uh, but mainly because you're asking some good questions, and and then nobody's really attempted to to answer the why would he release Satan after a thousand years? Why did Adam and Eve were they in this position? And, and uh, I, I, my conclusion is, is this is this is one of the reasons that our Calvinism uh, can't work uh, is that um, in Calvinism. God, they say God has made man kind of as a robot with uh, with no free will. And the problem is, if you're if you're a robot and you have no free will, then you you cannot choose to love God or not love God. Uh, so, uh, if man has a free will and God wants us to love him, he could have made us into robots. Because if you program a robot to love you, it's not truly love because it was a, it was not a free will choice. So I think Adam and Eve had to be in a position. God had to put in a position where they could choose to believe him, to love him, and stuff, uh, or not. And and that's the only way the love really meant anything. Uh, if, otherwise, he could have made him a robot, and then they never would have believed the devil. Okay, they chose to believe the devil. They fell. And then they understood, and they, I guess they repented and believed after that and loved God. Now, these people in the millennium period, uh, they have to be put in a position where they have to choose also. Because in the millennium, you have Jesus as the king of the world, <laughs> you know. And so he's there. There's, uh, there's no question of believing in him because he's there. Everybody knows who he is. And, and, uh, but they still have, they, there's no choice to be made. So by bringing Satan back... All these people in the millennium period are in that position also because God wants every person who's ever lived to be in a situation where they have to make a choice. Do oh. you want this relationship with God or do you not? So I believe that both of these cases, it's a way that God lets man exercise his free will and choose God or not. And I yet, never thought of that. That's good. And yet what's interesting is about our topic tonight and everything with that, Luke, is we're arguing on the panel here and everything that once somebody chooses to be saved, they've made a permanent choice. In other words, they've used their free will and they no longer have it to give their salvation back. Because that's one of the main arguments I hear against eternal security is, well, if I'm still free after salvation, I can get rid of it or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we could talk about that now or we could talk about that as we go through these uh, controversial verses uh, when that subject comes up. Right, I just thought I'd add it to the free will thing, so... What do you do? You want to talk about it now? Is it in context of the conversation, or no? No preference, really. It just reminded me of that when you were talking about the free will choice and everything. Okay, I think that's something that, uh, as far as the free will choice, to, some people say, well, you can't lose your salvation because you fell into sin or something, or or because of that. But you can lose it by just saying, I don't want it anymore. You hate God. You don't want a relationship, and you can give it back. Uh, so that when we get to verse that that does could be taken that way, then I think we'll discuss that. Okay. So uh, is everybody to move ready to move on, or is there anything you want to say about the verses I presented uh, before we go on, or uh, is it time to do that? I just I was just going to touch one more thing out there. It, it's not it's not for discussion. It's just something I wanted to say. Uh, has anybody ever seen uh, the old Spider-Man movie, the the original with Tobey Maguire? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And uh, that scene always stuck out with me when uh, Toby McGuire is with his uh, his uncle at the time, and they're at the library, and his grandpa says, "With great pow power comes great responsibility." Mm -hmm. uh, that's the same with knowledge, I think, and humanity's really shown their way with it. And if I could start all over and have that choice, I think I wouldn't take it because to see what humanity has done with it. It hasn't been for the greater good, you know. It's always been for the for the worst. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, if I could go back and, and have that choice, you know, I, I, I know the responsibility that comes with it, and I'd, I'd rather not have it. I'm not sure I followed that. When you say you'd rather not have it, uh, you're speaking it, uh, as yourself, you would re- not have a choice to be saved? No, the knowledge, the, the, the tr- like the tree of good Knowledge evil. of good and evil. Right, the knowledge, yeah. right. The knowledge. Oh, okay, but then, see, the problem with that is there's no love because there was no choice. Adam and Eve cannot express their love unless they're given a choice to to choose God or not, and that's why they had to have that choice. Okay. And at least that's that's how I'm seeing it. And uh, if you haven't considered that, I I don't know how else to explain that why God would uh, have them in that situation and why He would release Satan. So that to me that that answers it. Okay. All right. Okay, we're ready to move into these verses here, and uh, I've got some, but if anybody has one that you want to bring up, go ahead, feel free to do it. There's this one in Second Peter, I think it is, that I always get thrown at me. It says something, let me see if I have it right here. It says, let me see. It's, it's the one that says it'd be better if they had not known the way of righteousness. Let me see what the reference is. Let's see. Okay, yeah, it's Second Peter 2.21. Okay. Uh, can we put it, post it so we can read it? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll copy and paste it. You want me to read it real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I posted it. Okay, this is uh, well. What I pulled up was is Second Peter two twenty through twenty two. So I'll just read this part. Okay. It says, uh, "For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them, <clears throat> excuse me, than the first." For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. And that was the EV, ESV. Okay. All right, so Austin, uh, I mean uh, Jackson, you're, you're the one that gave us that verse. Uh, tell us what is the, the, the problem with the verse. How, how are you, how is it a problem? Um, well, what they're saying is, they're saying that these, see, these people knew the way of righteousness, that is salvation, at least in their minds, and now it's better for them to have never known it, and obviously it's better to go to heaven than it is to go to hell, obviously. So therefore, according to that kind of reasoning, they say this is losing salvation because they're people who knew the way of righteousness, they turned from it, and then now they're they're back to being not being saved. That's how I've always heard this verse. Mm-hmm. I get it. I get it in the context of uh, going back to living in the world or going back to your sinful lifestyle. The the perfect uh, sinful. Sinless extremists use this verse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, obviously, you, they, they would say that this is pertaining to someone losing salvation, but uh, it would have been better. Could that possibly be mean that uh, the rest of their life will be miserable because uh, it, they've... Uh, it's just part of the, the consequences of going, getting, moving away from God. Even, even though they didn't lose their salvation, they've lost their joy, their blessed assurance. They have oh, maybe doubts, and then now maybe they get involved in things in the world that they wouldn't have, be, wouldn't have. And, and then the law of reaping and sowing, they have consequences. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure that it would. Uh, you can uh, convince me that it's pertaining to uh, the the worst condition applying to going to hell. It doesn't, it doesn't say that, but uh, I, I know I know how you're putting the pieces together there. 
Right. Well, the other thing to consider about this is at the beginning of Second Peter chapter two, which is where this verse is found in, it's, it talks about false prophets that are doing this, that, and the other. And this is a false prophet that does this, and he talks about how basically how lewd these people are, and just how utterly disgusting they are, and how they'll. In, at verse thirteen, it says they shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. I mean, it seems if you read the 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 two things about the context of this chapter say to me that number one, it probably is talking about hell, but number two, it's t doesn't. I don't think it's talking about people who were saved and are now going back to something. I think it's talking about yeah. false prophets. But Yeah, I, I think that this might be like a, a kissing cousin to the Hebrews verse that, that talks about the same kind of a point. It would be mm -hmm. better uh, those who have like tasted uh, tasted something and then, and then gone back. Uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll go over that verse. But uh, mm -hmm. in other words, it's, it's them to, to, uh, to not have known the way of righteousness. Now, knowing the way of righteousness doesn't mean you're saved. That's right. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you guys had that ability, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's, okay. that's right. I mean, knowing the way of righteousness and then rejecting it, like, it, like seems to me to be what, what, in context, this is probably referring to, yes. rather than these people being saved and then reaping a bad thing. Like, I do think it's very hard to argue from this chapter that these people are saved in any what way. Was, I mean, real quick, I just I don't mean to go back to that. What was the actual, I've got your, I've got the pasted uh, verse there. What is the actual chapter verse? What, okay, the it, it's uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, and the one that's pasted right there is, um, let me see which verse is. Oh, yeah, 21. The one I posted is 21. Verse 21, uh, verse 21. And Tanya read okay. 20. 22 for a little more context. But. Because, yeah, based on what Jackson just said, that's where I was going to kind of go with this. It, it, it simply knows you've known the way of righteousness. That doesn't mean to accept the way of righteousness. And we know the way right. of righteousness is to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. We have to trust completely on him, rely completely on him and his work at the cross, his his, his blood. So if, 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 if he's saying it's almost better if you had not known that at all and walked away from something that, than to know and then walk away because now you're without excuse. You have you've exactly. heard it. You understand, mm -hmm. yet you're still rejecting it. So this isn't a person that's accepted it and then say – people want to automatically tie more things to it and say knowing the way of righteousness implies that you've accepted it. You've been walking the, in, in the spirit. Now all of a sudden you're rejecting it and going – that's not really what that says here. It just says no, you've No, it. not in context. And also there's another thing too that I think should really be – and I already said this, but I'm, I think it bears repeating. So I think we really need to harp – on when the Bible is talking about false teachers versus individuals. You know, I really think there, there's a big difference there. For example, you know, even in Matthew 7, you know, it's, it talks about these people saying, Lord, Lord, and we've done all these the works in your name, and we've already exhausted that one. But the point is, the Lordship people and other people like to act like these are a bunch of individuals who are doing all these bad things, not people who are teaching a false message. So I think the same kind of thing could be applied here. Yeah. Yes. Okay, were you ready to speak more, Eric? I thought I cut you off. In yeah, the I um, because there was a verse about that exact thing that you had done a video not that long one, uh, not not long ago one. Um, oh, it was about um, uh, once again, right out of my head. See, yeah, I, I should have written that a, down somewhere. I did a video uh, titled uh, Matthew Seven, I think it was, or, or no, yeah. it, was called, it was called "You Know Them by Their Fruits." Yes, that was it. That's the one yeah. where you talked about knowing them by their fruits, and um, people automatically assume. Oh, and and I hear Christians all the time want to apply this. See, their fruits would be better if they were better Christians. So they're not real Christians because their fruits. Are, it's not talking about Christians in general. It's talking about false teachers. Again, we talk about this many times. Context, context. What is he talking about? You can't just take that and apply it to whatever you want later. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> yeah, the uh, the video I did on Matthew chapter seven, titled uh, uh, "You You Know Them by Their Fruits," uh, it's pretty thorough on that chapter, uh, but it really does make the point that the fruit it's talking about is the fruit of a false t teacher, a false prophet who's teaching a false message. And what is their fruit? Everybody who listens to them goes to hell, and instead, there, there's nobody gets saved. That's, right. that's true. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. But I think uh, you guys, uh, Austin, and you guys, uh, you, you really clarified this as far as uh, this is not 
uh, saying that they were believers. It's saying that they heard the message. Right. The they, way I take, they knew the truth, but that doesn't say that they were believers. So we have to just assume that these were people who heard it and didn't believe. Right. And I would have to. Um, I would also apply that to when it says in verse twenty here, where it says, "For after they would have, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world." I don't think that means they've escaped like like death, but a pollution of the world could easily be something that blinds you from be seeing the truth. And I actually think when you think about it, that's the more natural interpretation. So just in case somebody thinks, well, it says they escaped the pollutions of the world, I wanted to make sure we address that part too. Mm -hmm. You know, when you pollute water, it becomes much harder to see through it and everything. You know? Right. The, pollu the polluted oh, air, for instance, is smoggy. It's Exactly. Exactly. These people know the truth crystal clear, and they reject it 100% and keep on in their in their mm -hmm. evil ways. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I'll teach you. Uh, also, the word pollution and the word adultery could be probably interchanged here because uh, people hear the word adultery, and they always think in terms of sex and marriage, uh, unfaithfulness. Uh, but adultery, if you take it apart from that context, it, it means that something's not pure. Like if I have a, a, a pure substance and then I put something else in it, it's adulterated. It's no longer pure. And uh, that's the same thing with the message of salvation. It, it can be adulterated. Uh, the Jews were talking about it in the sense of their race mixing. They wanted Jews to only mm -hmm. marry Jews and don't go out apart from this uh, this group. And if you did, that was a form of adultery because you you're uh, diluting or you're making your race unpure uh, of right. the descendants of Abraham. I uh, like that. I like that pollution thing. Uh, we'll use it for salvation too because we're on top. Uh, I like to I like it to look at it that way for. Uh, Knowing we can't save ourselves, uh, if if something's polluted, just any sin, we've fallen from that perfect state. So again, how could something that's polluted enter into a perfect place? It, it it's impossible. It can't. You know, you need to have a perfect perfect person, the Savior Jesus Christ. So it's all Jesus Christ again. But it just amazes me how people think that you know they try to make Jesus Christ a math problem. Them plus Jesus equals eternal life. You know, but it doesn't yeah. make any sense. You know, it, you need His perfect record imputed to you. You can't, you can't have your polluted record and His perfect record to get into a perfect place. It doesn't uh -huh. make, it's logically impossible. You know, you need a perfect Savior, Jesus Christ, entirely, not just partly. You know, Austin just reminded me of a saying you hear a lot. You know, if if you're part of the uh, you can't be part of the solution if you're part of the problem, <laughs> and yeah. we're clearly part of the problem, so we can't be the solution. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Uh, all right. Can we go on to another verse? Anybody? Anything mm -hmm. else need to be said about that one? Okay. I had, uh, I had a different verse that I wanted to bring up. Um, okay. It's one that's often mentioned as far as uh, becoming unsaved, or so people want to try to use it. If you go to Revelation, there are several sections in Revelation that mention the word overcoming. And they want to um, tie that to overcoming, mean overcoming sin, uh, or you know, maintaining your salvation by overcoming sin. And Revelation chapter 3 verse 5 says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father. And people want to use that as a verse to say, See, uh, Jesus will blot you out of the book of life if you don't overcome. Yeah, and ironically, well, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, real quick though, again, this is one of those instances where okay, you're taking the word overcome and you're tying a wrong definition to what he's talking about overcoming. In fact, there's a definition of those who overcome. If you go back to First John chapter five, verse five, and he says, "Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God." So that's the person who overcomes. Okay, let me, I, I know that I think it was Jackson that wanted to comment, but be, uh, sure. let's keep in mind that uh, I want to call on Sister Tawny to talk about this. She did an excellent video on this very verse. So uh, we're going to call her on, as our resident expert on this verse. But uh, first, first we'll have Jackson go. Oh, I was just going to say that... Um the interesting thing is I've always looked at Revelation 3.5 as an eternal security verse rather than a, rather than a lose your salvation because he says he will not blot it out he that overcomes. Exactly. Now, I, now I'm going to give it to Tanya. Yes, thank you. 
You know, I can't even remember what I said in the video <laughs> that I made. <laughs> um, I know, and it, it was good. You're right. I read this article that I had found and stuff, and it was really, it explained this really well. But um, I was basically just going to repeat what Jackson did. Um, the verse doesn't say anything about him blotting out anybody's name. He says he's not going to do it. And and this is, well, like every verse we're going to encounter, it's people just, you know, putting their own um, spin on it and, and, and interpreting it their own way, you know, and it's, uh, that's not what it says, you know. Yeah, exactly. Jackson... <laughs> It's okay. Ja Jackson's point and, and what Tanya said both. And I, I tell you, if if you start at First John and you read what First John clearly says, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth the Son of uh, Jesus is the Son of God. Then you read all these overcome verses. Overcoming is mentioned many times in Revelation. Okay, and when you get to three five, you read that. It's you see how the people who Want to want to convince people you can lose your salvation? They actually work towards this goal. It's not as if it's plain and right there that you can do it. It's almost like they, it's almost like they're working to try to to try to find ways to make you believe you can. And to take that verse there, like Jackson said, it to me that's a confirmation of your your eternal salvation. Not not that you're gonna lose your salvation, but people twist it and say, "See, but it is possible uh, uh, he could blot you out if you don't overcome." They immediately go to the negative side and say, "Oh." See, he'll blot it out if you don't overcome. I mean, there's a lot. There's a name for this logic fallacy. It's like the, I forget what it is, unfortunately. But there's a name for the logic fallacy where thinking a negative statement proves a positive one. I can't remember what it's called. Like for example, if I say there, it's like it's like a really absurd thing. But like if I say there is a there there is no Sasquatch in the woods, there prove that proves there is a unicorn. For me, an extreme example, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> But but the thing is, it's like that. It's it's a fallacy. I, I'm kind of bugging me. I wonder what the name is. I mean, after the show, I'll look it up. But let, I think that's the case with Revelation three five. Okay, I I, I want to say that uh, I I agree with all your conclusions. One that uh, the overcomers are explained in First John that everybody who believes in Jesus is an overcomer, and that's the definition of what an overcomer is. And the verse actually declares that we're not going to get blotted out. So it is it is proving our eternal security, not questioning it. But the problem is some people are, I don't know the name of that logical fallacy either, uh, but it, it's they're basically what they're doing is they're saying that uh, you, they won't be blotted out, so therefore you have to conclude that some people will be blotted out. <laughs> right. You know? yeah. uh, but it, it doesn't say that at all. Uh, but let me say that Tanya's video... Uh, I think it's called uh, uh, "Who Will Be Blotted Out" or something out, or "You Won't Be Blotted Out." Watch, watch her video; it's very good. But I'm surprised I remember more about her video than she does. Uh, especially, I'm an old man with very feeble-minded. <laughs> uh, but Tanya, let me let me give you like a, just a refresher, and maybe you want to talk more about this. It says the Book of Life, and then you got the Lamb's Book of Life. You want to elaborate on that a little bit? Remember? Oh yeah, there's so there's two books. That was the main thing, and um, yeah, nope. I did. go ahead, Luke. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. All right, the everybody is written in the book of life. Every person when you're born, That's you're right. written in the book of life. Okay, and and you, you're going to be blotted out of that book of life if you don't put your faith in Jesus. You're going to have uh, uh, perish. You're going to have death instead of life. So we received eternal life. So we're not going to get blotted out. So out of that book of life, it's because we are written in the Lamb's book of life, the ones who have eternal life. So, and I think that there's a, another uh, thing that uh, I don't know if I can prove it, but besides a book that lists everybody that's ever been born, and then the people, and they're all going to die because we're all mortal. So they need to receive, uh, trust Jesus to receive eternal life, and then they are put in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, otherwise, everyone else is blotted out and they die. But I do think that there's another book for every person, and that's a record of every person's life that is kind of like read at the at the great white throne judgment. Your life is like reviewed, you know. Um, so I think that those are the books. It talks about the books will be opened. Um, all right, are we ready to move on? Yeah, I got some here. 
Uh, wait, wait a second. What did what did you think of what I just said? <laughs> okay, go ahead, Brother Austin. Okay, this is from our uh, commenters. Just want to give a shout out real fast to Brother Chris, Brother Gilbert, and I'm not. Uh, forgive me, Christ Bride. I, I don't know your name. I apologize. But uh, Brother Chris uh, commented two different sets of verses. I looked at them. They're both. They're basically the same thing. I'm just going to use Luke uh, 12:46 to sum it up, and I'll post it and I'll read it. Okay. Okay, it says, The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Ooh, I can see that one being an issue, or, you know, confusing. Uh, so what? Uh, okay, you can see it. Well, what? It, I don't really see a problem with it. So tell me what the problem is. Um, the part where it says, "and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers." If he's speaking of believers, then to appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Uh, but I guess we would need to see if this is talking about hell. You know. Well, I think more than that, it's it's talk. It, we got to find out if it's talking about a believer. I mean, if you look at it in context, yeah. before and after, does, is this person said to be a believer? Because from what I'm reading there, uh, we'll we'll uh, cut him asunder and we'll appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Or you could put in the word with the other unbelievers. It seems to me like he is an unbeliever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it does. So I, I don't really see any. I don't. You know, maybe some people can create some problem there. But that verse doesn't seem to be uh, difficult for me. It does say that the Lord of that servant is they talking about the devil. Uh, well, first of all, you got to identify what Lord means and what servant means. You want to try that? Okay. Did you want to? Did you want me to pull it up in context? Uh, yeah, I look at it in context, but if we're going to talk about the, if you're questioning what the Lord and the servant means, uh, what about um, uh, Jesus and Judas? Jesus, Jesus was Lord to uh, to Judas, and that's, in other words, in, not Lord in kurios like God. He didn't see him as God the way Peter did. He saw him as Lord as okay, you're in charge, you're the master, okay, but. He, and he was also a servant. He was an apostle and a disciple. But I made this point in a recent video. He was not a believer. See, some people are, are disciples and servants, but they are not believers, like Judas. Some people are, are believers, uh, and, uh, then they're, but they're not uh, disciples. They're not very good at serving and you know, maturing and growing and becoming very uh, good Christians, but they believed. So uh, you don't, they don't, and then some people, hopefully that's us and others, I said, we're, we're believers and we're disciples. We, in other words, we want to grow and we want to sit at Jesus' side and learn from him through the scriptures. Uh, we want to be students and learn. We want to uh, do his, his will and, and have him uh, in charge of our life. Uh, so we're believers and we are trying to do our dis, as disciples and servants too. So in this case though, uh, in this verse, the Lord of that servant, that doesn't mean they're saved. That just means that this is someone who's, it could be just like the person in the end of Matthew 7. Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things? Didn't we serve you? Right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Brother uh, Luke, I, that is something I always wanted to know. Where does it say, in the, or even if it doesn't say in the scriptures, where, where is it implied? Because it always has... Uh, mind-boggled me that Judas wasn't a believer because everybody always says he was unsaved and I you know just so I can tell somebody else if they ask that question where would I tell them that that was a well a, a, the verse that comes to my mind is not saying he was not an unbeliever but the verse says that he was the devil 
And some people believe that Judas really was the devil incarnate. And just like Jesus uh, became a man, well, the devil became Judas. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying that I can prove that, but Scripture does say that there's a devil among us, and it, I think that there's more than one place where it refers John to... John 6 is the verse yes. I always go to. What yeah, is there's it? A, um, post yeah, it. I, Anybody who can find it, post it so we can see, but he is called the devil. Well, and, there's a verse that specifically says that Satan entered him. Yeah, Satan, Satan entered yeah. him. So uh, Now, if he's a believer, uh, there, if he's... A, a faithful servant of God. There's no way that would be allowed to happen. Well, didn't they say that about Peter too? No, Peter was being. That was a different thing. He didn't. It, the Bible doesn't say Satan yeah. entered Peter. Oh, Jesus rebukes the fact that he's being yeah. tempted to say the things oh, that he's okay. saying. J yeah, Satan yeah. was playing to Peter's emotions, and he was trying to get emotions, you know, to to say the things that he didn't that he shouldn't say. And he was um, telling him, you know, get thee behind me, Satan, because he wasn't. He wasn't. It doesn't say at any point that Peter was entered by him. I mean, it specifically oh. says Satan entered Judas. Oh, yeah. okay. <clears throat> Okay, so Austin, I would like to share this verse with you about this because I, 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 that's what people love bringing up Judas and everything. John six sixty four, Jesus is talking. This is red lettered and everything. It says, "But there are some of you that believe not." And he's talking about he's talking to his disciples and everything here. And then at the very end of the chapter, John six seventy one, last verse, it says, "He spake." I mean, for, okay. To be fair, we'll read verse 72. He says, Jesus answered him, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? And verse 71 says, He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for mm -hmm. he, for it was, for it was, for, no, sorry, for he it was that should betray him, being mm -hmm. one of the twelve. So I think mm -hmm. that destroys that line of reasoning. Because I always am hearing about Judas, about how, oh, he, Judas lost his salvation. Oh, Judas is, you, according yeah. to your logic, Judas must be in heaven and all that yeah. garbage. He, he, so he, he, was, he was never truly a believer. Never. Okay, thank you. Now, let me ask, let me, let me ask uh, Eric, mm -hmm. since I'm the old man and you're the next oldest, Okay. Oh, am I really? <laughs> yeah. What do you think of these these young saints and their ability to so quickly like build a case the way the way that um, uh, Jackson just did in almost in a matter of twenty seconds he found the scriptures and built like three scriptures together to show to answer Austin's question where does it say that uh, Judas was, was not a believer? Wasn't that wonderful? That, that was that was fantastic. I mean. Um, I'm it, it gives me well, no, it gives me hope for the future. <laughs> it really does because there there are so many young people out there who just have absolutely no interest and just um. Well, unfortunately, they're, they're yeah. preyed on. They're preyed on. I'm, well, I'm, I'm a student at Colorado State University right now, and there's this church that I know of that meets here that just 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 deceives so many people, and they teach you can lose salvation. They teach you've got to do good works. They yeah. they just. To preach a totally perverted gospel, and mm -hmm. when they were just telling me this and scaring me with this and everything, I thought, you know what, I'm going to actually just set aside all preconceived ideas, and I'm going to actually study this, and I found one Luke's video, Lordship Salvation Liars, what a great first step for me and everything. <laughs> it's so, funny how the Lord opens the doors when you're seeking yeah. the truth. Oh yeah, he yeah. totally opened my eyes, because I was ready to agree with these people if what they were saying was biblical, but now I realize it was all... Uh, a mishmash of garbage and misinterpretation and stuff. So. Well, I tell you, then well, you're yeah, you're wise beyond your years because I mean, a lot of young people are, I mean, especially in this day and age, are very impressionable. I mean, it's it's I mean, especially at a, at a school of higher learning. These other, I mean, I, I I don't envy your position because I mean, I know it's a battleground out there in in the colleges in uh, in America, and it's it's um and all over. So it's it's tough. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I was so happy when uh, uh, Jackson sent me an email about the difficulty on the campus with the people he's dealing with, and the the, the lordship salvation was so predominant, and this and the university street preachers would come out there, and what he was going against was you know he I'm sure he felt all alone and confused, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just really happy that you've uh, got this blessed assurance now. Okay, do we have another verse to go to? Um, I wanted to go to another verse in um, in Revelation, and forgive me, I'm kind of taking, I'm a 
hunt and peck guy, so you got you got to forgive me. I'm not exactly a typist, so um, <laughs> it's Revelation. Um, hold on one second. Let me uh, lost my page. You guys go ahead. If you got another topic, I'll come back to it. Okay. Um, well, we we've talked about uh, uh, enduring and and uh, and uh, blotting out and uh, the. Uh, Overcoming and stuff, so we don't need to go over any of that again. But no, this there, wasn't a, this wasn't there's a, overcome. There's um, a verse. Uh, there's someone sent me this, um, uh, and I've done various uh, videos, I think, on on the prodigal son. But it says he sent me an email. Said people use a line from the prodigal son that says he was spiritually dead, then alive again, and say he lost his salvation and got it back. I don't think that is exactly right, but can you explain what that means exactly? So, uh, so basically, we just really need to explain what the, the prodigal son story is is uh, teaching us. And uh, anybody want to go? I, I've already made probably two or three videos at least uh, on that subject. So go ahead if anybody has something to say. Okay, first of all, uh, is the prodigal son uh, someone who is, um, is this talking about getting and losing or gaining, regaining your salvation? It, first of all, do you, do you think that is, could possibly be the case? Or is, it, or is something else the whole subject of the... Of the, uh, the I, I always the, thought that the subject was, is not salvation. Right. Um, the subject to me, though, and some people may agree with me, and I've heard I've heard two different versions of this. I do believe it is talking about a person who is God's child. Well, notice how the prodigal son was his son the whole time, even while exactly. the prodigal son. Exactly. I, I can just imagine if the if if the kind of God we served was the kind of God that the lose it people think exists. I can just imagine the father going down to the local. Uh, I don't know, DM. Where would you even go and filing all these papers to disown him and everything? No, that's, right. that part is not in the story. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> all right, so that's that's the first point we need to establish is that uh, it declares that he is the son, and so just as Eric's a son, Tanya's a daughter, and you know we're a child of God. So I, I think that it starts off by making that point. Now he goes off. And he ends up in a pig's pen. Now, my question is, does he become a pen, a pig? <laughs> no. no, he does not stop being a human being uh, uh, and a son to the man. He remains a son. He doesn't change into another species as a pig. But he does get in the pig pen and he gets filthy. The right? frog prince is not a biblical story. <laughs> right. <laughs> so when he's in the pig's pen and he gets filthy, how do you explain that? What's going on? He's 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 falling into a he's a son, but he's falling into a life of rebellion. He's he's falling into a a, a point where he's defiling himself and doing things that he shouldn't be doing as a son. Okay, uh, I think I titled my video on this. Uh, like, is it is he the prodigal son or the backslidden son? I think we should be better if we called him the backslidden son. Yes. Okay. Because that's really what you're learning here is here's a son. He goes off. He backslides and gets into debauchery, but he never turns into a pig. He's always the man's son. And even while he's away, before he comes to his sentences, his senses, and he he repents of this, uh, you know. A rebellion, and uh, he he wants to come home, and the, all the while the father has never turned his back on him. That's what I don't like about First John one nine is that people think that well you got to confess your sins, otherwise you're out of fellowship with the God. Well, you might have turned your back on God while you got involved in sin or something, but God's never turned his back on you. The father's out there waiting with open arms all the time. He has fellowship, but the son's the one that's broken the fellowship, and all the son has to do is come back. And before he came back and even apologized, the father put the robe around him and Roman and welcomed him and wanted to throw a party, but he didn't even have a chance to apologize. 
So yeah. this is not a story about gaining and losing salvation. It's a story no. about backsliding and then coming coming back. <laughs> It's actually it's actually a story more about what we're talking about. It's a story about a person who is a child, who is already, if you want to call it the claimed salvation, is a child of God, but has fallen into a state of rebellion. Okay, and the all the all the rebellious child has to do is come back to the father and say, and and it's it's forgiven before he even his, it's in his heart already to come to the father, and the father is already there waiting for him. He's he's already wait. He never stops being a son. He never the, the father doesn't disown him. He can't stop being his child. It, it speaks to the fact that no matter what you do, that relationship can't be ended. It won't be over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Does anything else need to be uh, said about the, this uh, situation, the prodigal son? Yes. Uh, Christ Bride asked a question. That he it, it says that he was spiritually dead and then he was alive again. Where is it? So give me the scripture that says he was spiritually dead. That's not in the in the story as far as I can recall. Can anybody find the actual verses? Because when I've read the story and I've read it many times and ta taught on it, I never remember it saying he was spiritually dead. That might be somebody teaching, saying, you know, I'm telling you that he was spiritually dead. He was dead uh, in the sense that the father said, my son was dead but is now alive. It doesn't say he was spiritually dead. In other words, he was dead in the sense that as far as he, the father knew, he thought he'd gone and never come back and maybe he was dead. He didn't know what had become of him. So it doesn't ever say he was spiritually dead. That's not just like jumping to a conclusion to somewhere someone wants to go because they want to make it make that be the answer. Yeah, I, I've never read those words in there. Um, no, I don't think you're going to find it in any translation that he was spiritually dead, uh, but they're interpreting it. When the father said, my son was dead and now he's alive, they, they, they're interpreting it that he was spiritually dead, but it doesn't say that. So don't don't jump to that conclusion. Right, it's just right. like, just imagine, just imagine if you're a parent, that your son gone away for years and you don't know if he's alive or dead and you think you're afraid he's dead and he comes back. You're like, oh, my God, you're, you're not dead. You're not dead. I'm so proud right. you're not dead. <laughs> oh, darn it. I thought you were dead. Uh. Yeah, that's what it says. It does say he was dead, but then he was alive, but he, it never says spiritually. That's somebody's yeah, teaching. Do you, under, you understand the, the man's reaction? If I was my son had gone away, and, and I didn't, hadn't seen him, and, and I didn't know what become of him, and we're all worried, thinking maybe he's dead, and then he comes back and says, oh, he, he's not dead. <laughs> you know, he's not dead after all. We thought he might have been dead, but now he's alive. We're so yeah. happy. You know, yeah. there's another there's another part to the story that people tend to leave out, and this is the reaction of the other brother who was always more more faithful in that he was always with his father and obedient. Yeah. The the brother the other brother doesn't even refer to him as my brother. He goes to the father and says, "This son of yours was gone." I mean, he he essentially is stating, "I don't have nothing." Yeah. In, in essence, isn't the story really speaking about these people who look down their nose at other Christians because they may not be living yeah. up to the expectations of theirs? I mean, yeah. there's, it, it, that's the brother, and he's saying, he's saying, look, your brother, your brothers who are still your brother, okay, are just yeah. having some difficulty and some problems. You know, yeah. Th but they're back. They're back with us in fellowship. They're back with us in our relationship where I can bless my son again, and you can bless your brother, and we can celebrate together because he's back in he's back in that fellowship relationship again with us, where we can actually you know achieve good things together now because our relationship is healed. It, it's that's what I think is speaking to. Right. I want to say, too, that um, if anyone has ever read any books by Zane Hodges, he has one book called Absolutely Free. I put it in the comments. He does a great job of handling this parable, in my opinion, if anyone wants to read another well-known scholar's opinion. So. I think that uh, Eric's point about uh, the other brother is a very important uh, thing right. to incorporate into the study today. Uh, because the, he, this brother is the type of person that would send us this verse. 
Yeah. You know, exactly. He's the type of person right. that is, is going to challenge someone whether they he's not even my brother, you know, he, he's not a real member of the family because he's look what he's done. Look, so these are the people that want to like judge everybody's salvation based upon it, how they see you know how well they're doing or not. Right. And he and he's self righteous thinking I stayed here, you know, look at me, you know. Yeah. So really it is a very good um, it really helps us in a lot of ways to understand that. Yeah, um, he doesn't have any joy at all that his brother's back or any of that. And also, I just wanted to point out one thing um, that I thought was cool, um, that to notice that the son got all of his inheritance, you know, I think mm -hmm. that's that's significant, you know. Even though he, you know, made that choice, that bad choice or whatever, he still got his inheritance. The dad didn't say, well, no, because you're, you're getting ready to do something stupid. I'm not even going to give it to you. He still gave it to him. Yeah, that is a really good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Uh, all right, uh, do we have another verse to go to? Uh, I've uh, already brought up the verses that people have sent me to to make sure that we discuss. So I, I thought in all the time that we had here uh, uh, to prepare for this, you guys would have had a long list of other verses. Is, are that all the all the verses that we have that are? Uh, controversial that say, hey, you could lose your salvation? I got one, uh, one that's, uh, I don't think we talked about this one yet, but this one um, even still gives me a little bit of trouble, actually. And that is Revelation 3.16 where it says, So then, because thou art, thou art lukewarm, and neither hot or cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm I've heard that was used by a lot of different teachers in a lot of different contexts also. I can, yeah. I've heard it from uh, people that they're directing at the, the backslidden, sinful, carnal Christians to the lose your salvation, to the ones that weren't the super holy, perfect, I do everything, look at me, I'm the next Jesus kind of people. You know, I've, I've heard that verse a lot. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting verse to discuss. Tanya, what is your first take on that? Then how would you try to, how do you see that verse and, or explain it? You know what? I honestly don't know. So I don't, I haven't even tried to attempt to explain this one because this one I haven't quite figured out yet. And there, there's a lot of different things that, that could be discussed on this verse here. Uh, but... Uh, let me let me bring up one point at a time here. Uh, what is the context of of this uh, this particular verse? Well, Jesus is talking to the um, the churches or, or to John and messages for the churches, pretty much, yeah. and everything. So it's definitely talking to his people and everything. But what I think a key here that I have to mention is we should we should always take you know. One of the things being being an Aspie, being with Aspergers, we have trouble with taking things too literally oftentimes, okay? And you might think, well, maybe a losing salvation person is taking this literally by saying he'll spew them out and they'll 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 uh, they'll literally not be be saved or something. Whereas it's kind of funny, my first thought when I when I heard this verse as a young child, I was thinking of Jesus actually eating people and spitting them out because that's how my mind, that's how literal a picture my mind gets of certain things like this. So my point is jumping to a conclusion about the metaphor spewing them out of my mouth is probably the first fallacy of the lose it side here. Okay, that's that's uh, yeah interesting because uh, does first of all the idea of spewing out of his mouth. Do we have to autom just jump to the conclusion that he's talking about you're going to lose your salvation, or or, or could it be uh, a totally different meaning? Uh, I think that it is a totally different meaning, but first I'm asking you about the context. Uh, this is in Revelation at a time where he's talking about seven churches. This particular church is the church of Laodicea. Uh, I did a, a video on this, uh, on a Q&A video once. They asked me about these... Uh, I forgot the question, but I'm talking about the Church of Laodicea. And, and uh, there's a lot of different controversy as to how you see these, these seven churches. We know that in history, there were actually seven cities, Laodicea, Smyrna, and the others, uh, that had a, ch a church in it at that time. 
So there were act in, in history in the present tense is saying there there are these churches right now and it, it described these churches kind of the personality of the church. Um, and uh, if you study all those seven churches, you'll see there's various degrees of different types of attributes and problems. There's only one of the churches that there's no criticism, if I recall right, and that all the others are a mixture of good and, and, and uh, bad uh, descriptions. But the church of Laodicea, oh, by the way, all seven of the churches, uh, some people uh, believe that these are also applied to seven periods of church history. Uh, and I think that it's a pretty good um, evidence that that is the case. I mean, some people will argue against it, but I, I, I think if you if you look at it from that viewpoint, you can see at the very beginning of the church, for a few hundred years, the church fit w one of the churches the way that, that, that it was like full of uh, you know love and and then, and then martyrs, and then another period of history that shows how the church became corrupt through when the Roman Catholicism took over the church and then for a few hundred years it fits another description so um, uh, I think that if you study that out uh, as I did uh, I, I came on this the side that not only are they seven churches that existed at that time but they also described seven periods of church history now the last of them is the Church of Laodicea and if that is true what I'm saying then that means that we are on this seventh period of church history now and what is the description of the Church of Laodicea? What is Jesus doing in that church? Laodicea is the church uh, that's criticized for being an apostasy. But what? Yeah. But what is Jesus doing in the church, or at the church? I should say. What is he doing at the church? Because I don't want to say in the church, but at the church, what is he doing? Okay, he's not in the church. He's at it. He's knocking on the door. Mm -hmm. That is that. Tell, that tells oh, okay. me he is not in the church. He's outside the church, knocking. He wants to come in, but it's the church is not about him. The right. church is about faith healing, prosperity, all these things that we're seeing in the churches today, and it's the church is not centered on. On, on uh, Jesus being the center of our, our faith and everything's revolving around Jesus it's all revolved around uh, you know uh, what can uh, God do for me my healings my blessings my prosperity Benny Hinn and all that kind of stuff and Jesus is, wants to come in and wants to be the center of our attention but he's outside knocking so right. but then other people have argued that all seven of these church churches whether they're seven periods of history or not, they are all true at any given time, that you can find examples of each type of church even today. If we were mm -hmm. to go around the world, we could find a church that fits Smyrna, another one that fits Laodicea, another one that fits Philadelphia or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are different ways of, of looking at it. Okay, That's the kind of the context of, of it all. But when it says uh, you're lukewarm, lukewarm, but I would prefer that you're hot or cold, but you're lukewarm, so I will just spit you out of my mouth. So how do we explain what, what what's the problem with being hot or cold versus lukewarm? I mean, what what is hot? He says he actually prefers that you're hot or cold, mm -hmm. not lukewarm. Because what's happening here is they they were uh, they were fence sitters. They wouldn't make an actual. They weren't actually making a decision one way or the other. They wanted to sit on a fence and not actually make a full decision one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, lukewarm. People think lukewarm means that you have no uh, no passion, right? Right. Yeah, I'd say I agree with that. Okay, but lukewarm could also be a word that just describes undesirable. It's not. It's not. It's not appealing. It's like, for example, if uh, if I was to offer you, say, come over to my house for drinks, and I have a, a hot drink like hot coffee, and, and and I have an ice drink like a a, 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 a soda with ice in it, and, and then I have another drink that is just bland and, and room temperature. Yeah, and I just, saw this you know, once. Yeah. I saw, are, are, are you go you're gonna like you're gonna like the hot drink and you're gonna like the cold drink. So it's not like if you're hot that like on fire for the Lord. It doesn't mean that because the cold drink is also desirable. If you're hot or cold. So in other words, if 
you're, if you're lukewarm in this case, just means it's, it's you're not what I want. Your attitude is not what I want. Okay. So you're not. So then, are you taking the viewpoint, Luke? There that cold does not mean like totally against God. Then. Yeah, I am taking that. That's I'm saying. I haven't the, considered that. I'm saying. I'm saying a hot, cold, and lukewarm just means that you know, I'd rather have you be hot or cold. Uh, yeah, so and, and you're the, not. The, you know, I could, I could, I could drink a drink if it's hot or cold. I would enjoy it, but yeah. I don't enjoy being around you. So you're you're like a lukewarm drink. I don't want to be around you because yeah. he doesn't like what the church is about. Yeah, th that that's a really interesting way of looking at it. In other words, oftentimes we might just jump to the conclusion that cold means totally against God or whatever. Yeah, another yeah, it is. It, it, people jump to the conclusion that hot means you're on fire for the Lord, cold means that you're cold to God, yeah. and but no, it's talking about the the uh, the his his distaste for you. Right. Well, if it's hot or cold, and he enjoys you. If you're lukewarm, I don't enjoy. I don't enjoy what's going on in this church. I don't like it. Yeah, this and, is pretty. And, yeah. Uh, let me let me get to the spit you out part. Spitting you out is just goes along with the rest of the analogy. It's just that if, if you're if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out. It's not something I like. It's not yeah. spitting you out like you're losing salvation. It's just saying I don't like lukewarm drinks. I mean, you're just like you know, you're not. I don't. You're not appealing to me. You're not attractive. You're not tasty. Yeah, it's. It's so interesting. This totally reminds me of something, a, a little tell, a Christian television program I saw over a decade ago now that I haven't thought about in years where it was like this really corny Western show. But anyway, this guy had the milkshake that was cold that he liked, and he had this hot chocolate that was hot that he liked. And he's like, now I'm going to try this lukewarm chicken noodle soup. But I remember he drank it on the show, and he just like spit it out. And I was laughing so hard. I was probably only seven years old or eight years old or something like that yeah. seeing the show. And just Luke's analogy just has totally brought that back into memory, 100%. So... Yeah, that's um, that's a very interesting perspective. I don't think I've ever heard it put that way before. Um, that that that's good. I never I never considered it in that regard. That that's uh, that's good. So yeah, if, like if, if that is the case, if my take on this is correct, the meaning of it, then spewing you out has nothing to do with you losing your salvation. It just uh -huh. has to do with his disgust. Yeah, you're I'm not satisfying to me. This. I'm disgusted with this church. Yeah, you're not satisfying me. You're not. Yeah. You're not. Yes. Yeah, that you know that does make sense. And then, because down at, towards the end there, it talks about just like it does with every letter, to him that overcometh, I will grant. You know, um, and then we've determined that to him that overcometh is referring to somebody who has Christ. So we know that already. So he's what Luke says makes perfect sense in context and with what this says because he's not even telling them hey you have to get hot or hey you have to get cold he's not even saying that he's just saying I don't like it mm -hmm. and another thing I noticed and I don't know if this means anything or not it's just something that I noticed did you guys notice that all these letters are written to the angel of the church specifically Unto, and unto the angel of the church of so and so, it's always to the angel. I don't know. Yeah, I don't angel know. means messenger. Messenger, and, right? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't mean I don't think they're like like one of God's angels there. I think it's whoever's delivering the message. Oh, okay. I see. Churches. So. Well, I I think that yeah, you could say messenger, but I've also heard it taught that uh, it could be the pastor because the pastor is the one that gives the message to the body. To the, oh. the congregation. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, uh, we are we finished with that one? Want to move on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask Brother Jacks real fast. Was that show you were watching? Was it called Hee Haw? Uh, I don't think so because Hee Haw, while they sung some gospel songs, is not necessarily a Christian show. This okay. was broadcasted on a Christian channel with the, these people dressing up like cowboys, and I remember there were these really cheesy skits. I kind of want to find this show again, but like there's like, we have to catch Bad Bart, the sheriff will be praying and stuff, and it was, it was like cheese factor to the max, but that's the only thing I remember about it. No, Hee Haw, I think, despite there being some gospel songs, I think was a secular show, but... Okay, yeah. Uh, I can see another verse that someone asked me about, uh, but... Uh, 
I think we touched on this a little bit last time, and I'm not sure that uh, it's necessary to go over it again. But uh, we actually, we didn't really do a real thorough job on it, and we probably have differences of opinion on this too. But um, the idea of being uh, getting the mark of the beast and have, or having your head cut off, uh, people could say that uh, if you take the mark of the beast, then you lose your salvation. So uh, how do we explain that? I, I know that Eric had, had an opinion on that last time, and I talked about uh, what I think this being this enduring to the end concept was 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 how we were discussing this verse. Do we, do we need to go into that any further, or what do you think last time was sufficient? Does it say that you can lose that that they will lose their salvation if they take that mark? I'm pretty sure it does. Okay. Yeah. Or I, I'm not necessarily they'll lose it, but it won't be offered to them. So it's not necessarily okay. like they lost it because you can't lose. If you have it, you can't lose it. So I don't think they ever had it, and now I don't think they can get it. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, Eric, why don't you present? Because you know, I, I've held your viewpoint in the past, and I'm not. Uh, uh, I, I don't agree with you completely now, but uh, why don't you make a little short uh, explanation of, of how you see this enduring to the end and taking the mark of the beast and stuff, and, and then I'll I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give another viewpoint on that. Sure, okay. Um, my take on this was, as far as enduring to the end, we were talking about the verse, was um, talking about the people who are going to be going through the tribulation at that time. Now, my take on that is salvation as we know it, our blessed hope awaiting the rapture for those who die in Christ and those who are still alive in Christ, is, a, is different for, for us in the church age now. When Once that happens, the people who have to go through the tribulation have to endure to make it through the tribulation to go into the millennial kingdom. There's no um, – and so it applies differently to them where, in fact, and like I said, the Bible mentions that the Antichrist is actually given the power to wage war against the saints and overcome them in that time. So he will execute them. He will uh, you know, he will cut their heads off as, as we talk about in the Bible. Um, um, so uh, at that point, time period, those people have to endure to make it into the millennial uh, kingdom. And at any point in time, you can at that point say, I mean, I don't think people really truly appreciate what it's going to be like at that time period, because people say, oh, I'd never, I would simply never take the mark. Yes, but you've never known starvation. You've never known uh, torture. You've never known seeing other people tortured. You've never known the kind of things that are be going, on, going to be going on at that time. And people will want that as an alternative to what they could be facing. Um, it, that's my take on, on what they're talking about there. It is not talking about a salvation because uh, Revelation to me clearly states that there are only two groups of people that are protected in the tribulation. The two witnesses who come forward with the message of the gospel and the 144,000 uh, from the tribes of Israel who are sealed. So th that's my right. take on that, on that point. And even the two witnesses die. Yes, even they die, and then they are they are actually raised uh, after a laying in the street for three days. Right. They they, <clears> get, they give gifts to they celebrate their death too. They, yes. Yeah. They celebrate the fact how that they. The environment's going to be like. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, like you say, people don't appreciate the seriousness of the situation. It will be literally hell on earth with the yeah. devil running the show for. Seven Absolutely. Years. Absolutely. So, let me ask. Oh. Let me see. I'm giving you applause to, because you've expressed that uh, that uh, doctrine, but um, uh, I'm going to present a little different viewpoint on that. But before I do, can anybody find the the mark of the beast that segment of, of scripture and post it so we can look at that? Because I, I want to read it and make sure that I don't uh, say something that's wrong. On this, I know a lot of people hold true to nowadays. They hold true to a a chip, uh, like an RFID chip or a tattoo or something. I'm not necessarily sure that holds true anymore. Now, I'm not saying that, that it can't be some type of uh, technology that will be used, but I think the RFID chip, I think, was maybe the, the premises or the foundation of what's to come. But I don't yeah, know I, think it's 
going to yeah, I agree, happen. Austin. I agree. I think that well, what you're seeing is what you're seeing now is not that because you have to understand what accepting the mark of the beast is. It's allegiance. It's not just it's not just somebody grabbing you and forcing this thing into you. You it's not like that. You you swear allegiance to the beast. You worship the beast as an alternative to the torture that you may have to go through of a life without having food water, shelter, or anything because you can't buy or sell without it. So you're, you're forced into basically living in caves and woods and or wherever you have to scavenge to get food. Um, I'm looking for someone to provide the verse that talks about uh, if they do not take the mark of the beast yeah, and, wor and worship. It says, mark, take his mark and worship him. Right. Can, can anybody find that so and post it? Yeah, the, the full, the full uh, reference is in Revelation chapter 13. And it's. I'll start at fourteen and kind of copy could you that and paste it. In it. There for sure, me? absolutely. I'll put that in there. Um. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Talking about the false prophet in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. And that, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and 6. Uh, I'm looking for the part that says, uh, that tells us that if they take the mark, that they're damned, uh, and there's another part that refers uh, to two things, taking the mark and worship. So if you can find the part that says oh, here, the mark and worship and... Oh, here it is. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. It was... Um, oh, let, me, let me copy that too. I'm sorry. Let me get... Um, the other... It further goes into description, I, and I started to do that, but it was getting kind of long-winded, and I didn't want to take all that up. <laughs> um, it's, uh, the, it's in the next chapter, uh, chapter 14. If you come down to verse 9, I'll paste this too. Um, sorry, these are long pastes. <laughs> um, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And their smoke and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Okay, there's uh, there's a lot of interesting things in here, but but um, I I believe uh, that uh, I haven't always believed this way. I, I thought maybe. In times past, that people had some combination of faith and works, and now it's just faith. And then in the tribulation, it's going to be some kind of faith and works. And the works that were required in in the tribulation period is uh, you must endure to the end, or in other words, you must either be martyred or somehow endure without taking that mark and worshiping the beast. Uh, otherwise, you go in this lake of fire. So, uh, in other words, there was like a probation. You know, like, you know, Sister Lisa Harang says, that's the question, is it probation or is it salvation? So what you're saying, I think, uh, uh, and that I have believed in the past, is that this tribulation period, is more, they're more on probation because if they take the mark and worship the beast, then uh, they don't have salvation. They must be willing. Uh, there's a verse that says, uh, 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 greater is he who is in me than uh, who is in the world. Or, no, no, that's another one. Uh, the uh, uh, oh yeah, we were saved by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They were saved by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. In other words, they believed in Jesus' blood sacrifice and the word of their testimony. In other words, they must be willing to stand up for it rather than be rather than say, oh no, I denounce it, don't cut my head off. Mm -hmm. So they must be willing to die for it. So that's how I've always seen that. Uh, so if that is the case, then that would mean that uh, 
pure faith is not the only requirement. They must endure without taking that mark. But here's the here's the thing that a friend of mine who's written several books I've edited for him, and uh, I should say he's a former friend of mine, but he came up with a concept I'd never heard, and now just recently I've heard that MacArthur or somebody is also teaching us, and they're saying that a person could take the mark of the beast and still be saved. And uh, my, my, my former friend differentiates this way. When it says here, uh, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So he is drawing a distinction and saying there could be people who take the mark in order so they can buy and sell so their family could be fed and they, you know, they would be spared. Uh, they'll take this mark, whether it's a, you know, a barcode on their hand or something, so they can buy or however, they, however this, whatever this mark is, they can't buy and sell without it. Or and if and if they don't take it, they'll be executed. So you have two things that are required, required here. If any man worship the beast and take the mark, so he said, if someone could take the mark but not worship the beast, in other words, even if they pretend they're worshiping. They're not truly worshiping because they're only pretending they're worshiping so they can spare their family. So that was his position and, I, and it was strange to me. I never heard it before and now I'm hearing that other people are actually accepting that. Uh, so these are the ways that you can look at that, but if that, if that would be the case, these people are not saved. Uh, they, they are kind of on probation. They, they believe in the blood, but they better not take the mark because this is the one thing uh, and mm -hmm. they better not worship the beast. Yep. Take and worship. Uh, so I, I don't really know what to think about all that, which way to fall on it. It's hard for me to accept. Now, there's another thing that says that there's a requirement for these people. Um, the sh sheep and goat are going to be separated depending upon how they treated the Jews at this time. Mm -hmm. And if, if you were friendly to the Jews, like, like in the Holocaust, the Jews were where some people hid them and tried to help them. And uh, if you help the Jews who are being persecuted at this time, then you're going to be a sheep. And if you didn't help them, if you turned them in, then you're a goat and you'll be separate. So you've got to you've got to help the Jews, and you can't take them the mark and worship the beast. These are the three things I see that are requirements at that time. Mm -hmm. Now the so one conflict, the one conflict I see with that, and I will say that, and and the people can disagree with me. That's fine. Um, I would. Me personally, in in my years of study and what I've experienced in this in this regard, um, I would say I would think that's a very dangerous theology to teach to tell people it's okay to take the mark of the beast as long as you don't really mean it. I, I don't think that's uh, I, I don't accept that at all. Uh, I think that because what are you enduring? Wait, you're, let you're me not, say, hey, you you're know. not really enduring anything. I'm only I'm only clapping because I want to interrupt you because a lot of times. Uh, you know, people make a lot of videos about me. <laughs> some people, some people try to find anything I say and make videos and call me a heretic. So Understood. I, I want to make it clear that I'm not endorsing this. I'm just saying that uh, a friend of mine wrote a book and stated that, and I said I think right. you really shouldn't be saying that. <laughs> and now, and now we got MacArthur or somebody else saying that. So don't anybody twist my words and act like Luke is teaching this now that you can take the mark. Please. Uh, no, no, uh, not at all. Not enough, at all. No. Enough people no. are misrepresenting, distorting, and out, outright lying about no. what I believe. No, not at all. And that's why my comment wasn't going to have anything to do with what you're saying. Um, uh, I, I, I don't want to speak for you in any way, shape, or form, and I would never do that. Um, I, I think you, you deserve a platform to be able to speak for yourself, and if people have a comment or have something to say about, about you or to you, then you deserve the opportunity to respond to that to let people know what, what you actually believe. Um, in this regard, I'm speaking to the people who are saying this, who you're saying are saying this. Um, you're, you are not enduring something. And this is the, this is the point behind the tribulation. This is what you're facing. If a person says, "Well, you know, I'm going to go ahead and take the mark, and that way I can do all the things I need to do," okay, well then, what are you enduring? You're 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 not um you're not giving up anything. You're you're doing, and it doesn't it doesn't differentiate. On well, the same token, it doesn't 
where you said it says worship and re and receive the mark of his name, it also doesn't differentiate and say there are people who took it but didn't really mean it. Um, I've heard people try to come up with that before, and I've never bought into that. I mean, this is a matter of, again, and this is a... This is where you know, we talk about the salvation and the probation versus um, salvation. And remember, this is the church age. This is the building of the church up to the rapture where the, de the believers in Christ who have died and the believers in Christ go at the blessed hope uh, you know, in the rapture. At that time when the tribulation starts, it's a different situation. It's a different time. Um, it, it, it does not, in my opinion and what I've studied, it does not apply in the same way to the people who were going through the tribulation. They, they are now under a time of testing and a time of trial, and that's the whole point behind the testing. The way, the way I always have thought of it, and I admit I haven't really done a lot of study on it, so I'm very, very willing to revise this or, or, or change this, but I always thought the people who took the mark of the beast are blinded from now on, and maybe somebody who's in the tribulation, because... I, I guess this is partially assuming a pre-trib rapture, although I guess not even completely necessarily. Those who are still in the, um, who, who refuse to take the mark of the beast, maybe because they don't want to worship someone or something like that, or they don't, they may not be Christians, but they're sensing something is really wrong about this worship of a person or something, and they are the ones who are going to endure to the end of the tribulation and then see that this guy was false all along and, and, and be saved. I don't know. Well, that's well I do, but I do see, I equate receiving of his mark with worship. They are, they are right, it's re right. receiving and the I mark actually, to, they're receiving the mark to show their approval of him. A Christian, yeah, exactly. a person, in, right, a person who, through the tribulation, either hears the the witness of the two witnesses or hears the witness of the 144,000 that are sealed as they go out and spread the gospel through the earth, they're not going to take that mark. They wouldn't want to be caught dead with that mark. They would rather die, which is why they go to their deaths. Um, the people who would say, well, I wanted to take it to uh, uh, get out of yeah. getting persecuted or getting, well, you're not, that's not really, um, at that point in time, that's not enduring through the tribulation. That's not your you're getting out of something uh, by doing that. So it's so the only way that I can see that we can hold to this doctrine one that um, uh, we we cannot lose our salvation. Right. Uh, is is in the context of what we're talking about right now is to assume that uh, if someone is saved. They're not going to take the mark. Uh, otherwise, uh, you, you can you have to say that uh, they uh, they lost their salvation because they were saved, and or or are we saying that they're not saved until the end, and you find out if they took the mark or not? Oh, that is kind of I see what you're getting at. So you're saying if someone was if they it <clears throat> well wait isn't the question is it still by faith? Is it still by faith alone and Christ alone during the seven years? Because don't I thought that only counts. I thought the salvation changes to he who endures will be saved. I thought it, I didn't think that you could you could do faith by grace and then do whatever you wanted because I didn't because then then they'd be conflicting. Well, the point is Eric's position here is a very very common position and and uh, probably a majority position that that. Uh, in that particular time frame that uh, a person has to endure and, and not take that mark otherwise it said in those verses they're going to be go to the lake of fire or something whatever it said and, and be tormented so uh, I always thought that um, I the what, what I always heard about the one in Matthew about will be saved that that's actually talking about a physical salvation not not a spiritual one well, he's talking that, about enduring that, uh, and God making sure their life isn't taken Brother, I think I can I can I can use that argument, and I did last time we in the last session. I used that argument when we we're talking about only who who endures to the end shall be saved. I said that means endure to the end of the tribulation without going without uh, being uh, you know executed right. and taking the mark. Then, then they'll be saved from the execution. They hit out. They were able to get through that whole period, and they were saved from the persecution and the execution because they were able to get through that. Uh -huh. but that does, that does not answer the problem of about he who worships and takes the mark of the beast is is going to be going to the lake of fire. That's that's a, that's another total different situation. So if in that case, I don't know any way to explain that uh, that these people 
are, are, are lost. Now, did, the only way that we can kind of rationalize this and say, well, the people who are saved won't take it. Now, that seems like a real simple answer, and I would hope that you know that will be a universal truth that people who are really saved just don't take the mark, and that settles it right there. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've always thought. Because I mean, at the at the same time, you know, it says in it says in Hebrews, if you be without chastisement, it says something like, unless you you be bastards and not sons or something like that. And I guess I can't imagine even the most carnal. Even the product, most most uh, uh, like the prodigal son, even the most backslidden Christian, taking the mark of the beast. It's just it's very hard for me to imagine them doing that. Mm -hmm. Because they well, would have the knowledge of the truth. That's that's what I would say. You know, they would know what would happen if they did. Yeah. Well, what, one of the other comparative things I like to use is when you go back into the Old Testament, and you look at the story of uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and when they are threatened to worship the gods under pain of death being thrown into a furnace, um, mm -hmm. they don't say, well, you know, we'll go ahead and just bow down to their gods. You know, we'll, we'll go ahead and... and uh, it, they didn't. They, they, they refused, right. flat out refused. And they were thrown into the furnace and they accepted that. I mean, I don't, th I don't think a person who would be looking to get out of something by taking the mark and knowing what it means and how significant it is, um, yeah. I, I just don't see that person as, a real, as really a believer. Yeah, yeah that's yes. true. And and all through the uh, the uh, the dark ages, through the persecution of all the martyrs, um, people were tortured. And, and and many of them, if you read Fox's book of martyrs, if you can stomach it, it's a very graphic explanation of the various tortures people went through yeah. at that time. And you have to just like be in awe of the, what they were willing to endure, uh, and not and not renounce their faith. But yet some did. Some did recant. Some recanted. And then felt guilty and went back to the fire a second time. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of ways people are deal with that. And right. uh, you know, as you said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Bebnego, you know, they they were willing to be, willing to be thrown into the fire, and uh, and God spared them. But how many saints over the centuries have been thrown into the fire and they were not spared? Okay. Um, all right. Can we? Uh, is there anything else that needs to be said on this? Because uh, I don't really have. Really, any strong conclusions or answers for this, for, uh, unfortunately? But uh, it's, we're it's, talking about a pretty obscure thing, a very specific obscure thing. We're not talking about the general person who believes and wondering if they're secure or something. Yeah. I think, I, I think the only safe, yeah, the only safe thing we can conclude is that that uh, someone who who believes at that time will not take the mark. That's the only way we can say. Otherwise, we're going to say that they believed and got saved, and they took the mark, and they lost their salvation. Right. And and you know, there's too many verses that say that you can't lose your salvation. You right. know, well, yeah, no, the mark, lose. taking the mark is, in my opinion, much worse than going and killing someone or something like that. You know, this is a lot worse than going and committing murder, adultery, or anything like that. This is something I can just imagine the Holy Spirit might even not let you physically make the movement if you try. I can imagine. I was going to say that because we, we'd be, be kept by the power of God, so maybe that would be under the special circumstance where if you are saved, it's physically impossible to receive the mark. Yeah. Yeah, I, and yeah you know something? That's, that's really I like good. I, I liked what you guys... I like what you guys both said. That's actually, and that's a case that's for me, and I happen to agree with that too. I think, you know, people will be given the strength to deny it yes. if they are truly in, if they are truly believers at that time. They will be yeah. given the strength by God to deny it. Yeah. Because um, I also do remember that when we have to give an account, or not us, but the people that are saved, they have to let the Holy Spirit speak through them at their, at, when they're being judged by the Antichrist or whatever. Right. That they, they submit themselves to God, and God uses them. So that, that evidence right there proves to me that if someone is generally saved during the tribulation, that they are kept by the power of God, and that physically that he would fulfill his word by being absolute truth, that it would be impossible to, for them to receive the mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I can just imagine trying to move your arm and not being able to, like you being stuck to take it or something. So, uh, did you see the um, uh, or read the books and watch the movies uh, called Left Behind series? I read all, I read all the books, uh, but I didn't I didn't see all the movies. 
There were 12 or 13. I know mm -hmm. I read them all, and, and I had them, but I ended up giving them away at one point. But uh, to me, I thought not only were they well-written fictions and enjoyable stories, mm -hmm. but I do think it, they followed what I, how I see eschatology. So I didn't have any conflict with, with all of it. Uh, but there was one point, in, there was one character in the book that was physically held down and forced to take this mark against his will. And so, but he, they were able to use him as like an infiltrator because yes. he, w he was really a Christian and he had the mark on his forehead that only Christians could yes. see. And that but was a big had problem mark, I had. Yeah, he had the mark on his hand that showed that he was uh, taking the mark of the beast, but he didn't believe he was. it was forced upon him. So that was an inter interesting scenario. That and was this guy saved you know? in the books too? Yeah, uh, yes. So yeah. it's not like he lost salvation because that would have killed me if they put oh, that. Oh no, no, he didn't because he didn't take it willingly. He, he was right. like they forced it on him. Was forced upon him, and uh, or he was knocked unconscious and he woke up and they had given it to him. So, so uh, yeah, that was another in interesting uh, possibility. But uh, in that case, they used him wisely as a, like an infiltrator because since he had the mark, he could get food and he could do other things. And he, they thought he was on their side, but but secretly he was really a believer and he helped the believers at that time. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's move on to the conclusion here um, because the two hours is almost up. Actually, the ten hours is almost up. This is the fifth. Uh, we've done five now that are about two hours each. So I think we've done a good job. Let's, uh, uh, let's, let's, let me just kind of sum up the 10 hours, and then I'm not going to take very long. I know sometimes I get really long, but I think I can sum it up in a minute, and then I'll ask everybody to make their closing thoughts on the whole thing. And, hey, and, Brother Luke, real fast yeah. for you, did it. can I just put one more verse out there for that, and we'll leave it at that? Go ahead. I was just going to – I remember that the verse came to my mind that uh, through men – all things are not possible, or something like that. But through God, all things are possible. So that, to me, that to me, you know, there there'll be something supernatural during that time. And this is everybody that's watching. I, I firmly do believe there will be some saved believers during that time. Uh, no yeah. matter how hard it is for us, all things are possible with uh, with the Almighty. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is another one that would support that. He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. Uh, so, Amen. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to do it as quickly as I can. And we we started off in the first session. I laid this foundation. I said, should we put our faith and build our doctrines on verses that are clear, simple, and uh, don't require any interpretation, or should we put our uh, base our doctrine on verses that are confusing and controversial, and everybody has a different way of interpreting it? And I think we all agree that it makes sense. If we have a verse that clearly says you're saved by faith and no works are required, and what we did was we cited a dozen, about a dozen of those verses to prove the point. And so we proved that uh, that's the logical way to uh, base your, your faith on clear verses. And then we proved that, that through verses that uh, you're, you're, saved, uh, you're not saved by works, you're not saved by a combination of works and faith, but you are saved by faith in Jesus and nothing else. Uh, and then we went on and discussed uh, uh, various verses that uh, people have given us uh, that they say challenge this doctrine that salvation comes through faith alone. And we went through all those verses and we all discussed them and, and answered those the best we could. And then we finally reached the point tonight where we're, we did the same thing with eternal security. I laid out some securely, eternal security verses that are clear that I think proved that once we're saved, we're always saved, we can't lose it for any reason, and then we've, after that foundation was laid, we've tried to discuss the verses people sent us that, that uh, they think uh, poke holes in that and that you could somehow lose your salvation. So uh, we've completed this now, and I, I hope this whole series is helpful. I mean, every time we go on to a new topic, sometimes the topic takes four or five episodes. Each episode is... Uh, you know, two hours long, and so these studies are pretty thorough, and I, I hope that people will take the time to go through them carefully. As Tanya said, that's why there's a pause button. You know, you, can, you don't have to watch it two hours. You can watch it five or ten minutes at a time, but if you'll patiently go through the whole series, the first one I did is called Biblical Christianity. That's where everybody should start, uh, and then work through all these other uh, series that we've done. 
So uh, that's what I want to say, and I'm going to ask each person to make any final statement as regarding this whole series, and and say goodbye to everybody one at a time. Let's start with uh, Brother Austin. Thanks, Brother Luke. Uh, this is something that I've been guilty of in the past, and still sometimes I do get guilty of. And it, it, this is something that you don't need to do. I just want to emphasize this. It's not needed, but after I found this example and I've kind of dawned on it, it, it is true, and you know it's something that I that I can understand and will hold true to. And that is, you know, we see all these people, and I'm not going to question their salvation in the, in the first part, but everybody that's wanting the rapture, you know, when's the rapture? The rapture has to be today. You know, I really hope the rapture is soon. Yeah, I mean, at the same time, I can understand, and no, nobody else would want anything less than that. But I think a bigger picture is we we should not necessarily say we want the rapture, but to go out and to tell more people about Jesus, you know, win more souls. Because in the end, if we're in the after the rapture happens, that's it. You know, we're gone, and uh, and then the tribulation starts. It's going to be hard for people. So the longer we're here, the longer that we have the grace time, even uh, even though our, our lives will be harder and it, it's going to get harder from here on out, it, there's still hope. You know, there's still hope to get saved, faith by grace alone in Jesus Christ, and there's still time. And Apostle Paul wrote this, and this was in uh, Philippians 1, 23 through 26, and he said, For I am in a strait betwixt the two, having a desire to depart, and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with with you all for furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So I say that as long as we're here, you know, I, I understand why people say that. And even myself, I've done it at the same time. But at the same time, we have to understand the longer we're here, the longer people have that chance to get saved, and we should get out there and win some souls. Yes, amen. Thank you. Okay, Brother Eric. Well, um, uh, building a little further on what Austin said, you know, the, the rapture is our, our blessed hope, our great joy, and of course, above all things, we, we wish to be with the Lord, and, uh, and that's where our heart is. Um, the imminency of that event um, should give us joy, but it should also uh, uh, impress upon us the, the desire to be more proactive to reach people out there, um, and that should be our concern. Um, anyone who's watching these live broadca broadcasts, thank you so much for watching them. If you stop in and just look, um, based you know, going off a little bit of what Brother Luke was talking about earlier, when it comes down to questioning, you know, there's, there's one person you can always trust. And that's Jesus Christ. You can always trust him. He will never leave your side. He will never forsake you. All right? And if you go to him with your questions, if you go to him, you will receive the answers. The Holy Spirit will give those answers to you. But trust him. Don't let doubt creep in. I've seen it happen to far too many Christians that their, their lives as Christians become stagnant and they become uh, uh, depressed and doubtful and they don't function well as a Christian because they're constantly doubting their salvation. Do not doubt your salvation. You are sealed forever. God has promised that. Trust him. Do not trust people. Amen, brother. Thank you. You're okay. Bro brother Jackson. Um, I just wanted to close with, you know, what we talked about tonight was, we, if, you, if you notice our conversation, even though the bulk of it was about eternal security, if you notice, towards the beginning of the show, we talked about uh, Genesis, and towards the end, we talked about the end times and everything. And I, I want, I, I kind of think this is an interesting picture about what, e what, 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 how, 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 the, how unchanging our, our eternal security really is. You know, from from the beginning to the end, it's always been faith alone in Christ alone for salvation and everything. You know, or I should say, from the beginning of when man fell, but. The point being, you know, how long? How long is eternity? It, it's forever. It's forever. You know, I, I don't see any consistent way somebody can say they believe in eternal life if they think they can lose it and everything. And I would like everyone to ponder just how long eternity is and everything, and how well, wonderful it would be to have everlasting life for that duration and everything. And on a more humorous note, just in case anyone was dying of curiosity, I'm now 99% sure the show I referenced about the cowboy thing is called The Gospel Bill Show. 
the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Jackson. Very good. And Sister Tanya. Yeah, I've really enjoyed this uh, series that we've done, and I think that we've proved very well that uh, you know we're saved by faith alone and Christ alone, and we're secure in that. And uh, eternal really means eternal. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think it's important that we don't read into the Bible; that we just read it uh, for what it says. Uh, reading into it seems to be what the problem is you know what it boils down to so um, and you know we don't have a spirit of fear we have nothing to fear and uh, you know you can't really experience that joy and that peace that Christ offers unless you trust him uh, and realize that we are eternally secure and that we are saved because of him not because of us and that is it mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well, uh, sister, I uh, I want to emphasize your point that uh, the joy and the peace. Uh, there's nobody happier than than a, a Christian who understands their eternal security and has this blessed assurance. Uh, but there's Amen. nobody more miserable, I think, than a, a person who thinks they're a Christian but doesn't believe in eternal security and is always afraid and worried somehow that they didn't perform well enough and, or they could lose their salvation. That's the most miserable person. Uh, yeah. The last thing I want to say is uh, kind of responding to what uh, Austin and Eric said about uh, end times and the rapture. You know, I've done a lot of street preaching, and I, I've met a lot of street preachers, and some of them are out there talking about Jesus is coming and the end is near and this and that. And, and um, I, I've always avoided that, uh, co connecting that to uh, my message of salvation. Because I, whether, as uh, I think Peter said, uh, uh, the Lord is not slack in his promise, uh, he's long suffering, not desiring that any should perish. The reason he said that is because people, even at that time, say, When's he coming? When's he coming? It's taken so long. You know, well, look how long it's taken, he hasn't come back. So uh, it, we don't want to base our message based upon he's, he's coming back because back, uh, uh, they're going to say, Look, you've been saying that for 2,000 years. So my point is, uh, if he comes back for and takes us in the rapture tonight, or a year from now, or a hundred years from now, well, I, I know he's coming back, but the point is, that's not really what we should be concerned about. Not when he's coming for us, but when we're going to him. You see, I'm 62 years old, and everyone here, life is like a vapor. This is a James verse. Life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time. And no one's promised another day. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put your salvation off to another day. Because uh, even if you think you've got 30 more years left or 40 more years left, don't wait. You're not promised another day. You could be hit by a car to, 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 tonight or tomorrow. So, so you need to get this right now. Don't put it off. What are we asking you to do? We're not asking you to join a religion. We're not asking you to become a religious person or follow religious rules. We're asking you to trust a person. His name is Jesus Christ. He is God Almighty. And he, he loves us so much that he became a man. He said the reason he became a man is so that he could die for our sins. And he did it. He was faithful. He willingly went to the cross and suffered so that all our sins could be charged to him. So the, the penalty for sin is all paid for. Jesus said, it is finished as he died on that cross. The, the obstacle between man and God now is no longer there. God, Jesus will accept you and embrace you. And he, Now the question is, do you want eternal life in heaven? If you do, then he's offering it to you. You just need to come to him to receive it. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. This is an exclusive message. Jesus is saying, Muhammad can't save you. Buddha can't save you. The Pope can't save you. The Virgin Mary can't save you. You cannot even save yourself, no matter how good you try to be. You need me. So I want you to come to this conclusion that you need Jesus to be your Savior. And he proved that he's he has the power to give you life because he raised himself from the dead. You can trust him. So all we're asking you to do now 
is reject all the religions of the world, reject the idea that you can somehow work your way to heaven if you're just good enough, reject all that and instead cry out to Jesus, Jesus save me, I need you. If you do that, please make a comment and we want to know about that because we will celebrate. So thank you everybody for watching and if you're on the panel, uh, we can hang out and talk after I end the broadcast now. Uh, I'm going to stop it right now. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.